This conversation begins in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 41, verses 55 through 57. And we're going to go to the book of Genesis chapter 42, verses 1 through 6 as a tag along. How many of you know that every action provokes a reaction? Every action provokes a reaction. I've got several points I want to make in this message and in next week's message. We're also going to be talking about trauma. I'm going to define it for us. And then we're going to be talking about drama. But that's going to be more in next week's message, but I'm going to highlight it a little bit today as well. Everything has a tipping point, but everything also has a starting point. Those are a couple more bullets I want to cover. And then the last bullet is God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. And if you're a believer, he's with you and I as well. So let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 41, verse 55 through 57. And let's see what the Holy Bible has to say to us. Now, keep this in mind as well. I'm not going to really go over or cover these scriptures in this message in detail. It's more for the drama part of the message next week, but I'm going to highlight, if you will, in my introduction, the story of Joseph up to chapter 41. So stay with me. 41, verse 55, Genesis. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. He says, I'm delegating. You know how bosses are. We always delegate. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. Good Lord. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Now, sore means it's painful. Yeah, it's more mental than anything. It's not really physical, but, but it is painful. It's a famine after all. Verse 57, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Now, I just told you the word sore meant it's, it's painful, but it's more mental. It's not really physical. But when the Bible says so sore, hey, that means it's painful. That means it's impacting my health. Keep in mind now, corn is an asset. It, it's what they're using, if you will, to sustain them through this famine. Genesis 42, verse 1 through 6. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? He said, what y'all doing sitting here looking at each other? <laughs> we down here starving. Get up and go. Well, let me finish. Hold up. Let me see what the Bible says. Keep in mind, Jacob is Joseph's father. And most of you know the story, so just stay with me. Verse 2. And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from this, that we may live and not die. Serious business. That we may live. And this is Jacob. This is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This is that Jacob. And he's talking about living or dying. If we don't get substance, we're not going to make it. And his son, who he doesn't know is still alive, has the power to bless them to live or to die. Jesus. Verse 3, And Joseph's ten brethren <laughs> went down to buy in Egypt. These boys always hang together, all ten of them. Verse 4, But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, is his youngest brother. Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest her adventure mischief befall him. This is one of those PTSD moments where something has happened and it's like, no, I'm holding on to this one. I'm not letting this one go. Verse 5. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. 
Canaan. Isn't that the promised land? How's there a famine in the promised land? Is it possible because the dreamer is missing? <laughs> Stay with me. Verse 6, And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him. They don't know who he is. With their faces to the earth. Bow now. <laughs> bow later. Take your pick. Bow now. Or bow later. Joseph is the second in command to only Pharaoh himself. But he's taking time out to sell this coin. Now, he could delegate that responsibility, but he's not. He's right there looking at who's coming and who's not. Doing this season of a famine. Guys, this is connected to where we are now. During this particular season that we're in, during our lifetime, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit has put on my heart to share with you. We are so busy feasting during this season of inflation instead of fasting in the midst of a possible famine. Therefore, we have lost or we are losing our faith and our favor with God. Let me repeat that again. This is important. We are so busy feasting during this season of inflation. I mean, everybody's going wild. Instead of fasting in the midst of a possible season of famine. Therefore, we are losing, if not lost, our faith and our favor with God, with the Creator. I told you there are two extremes here in this message, trauma and drama. And we're going to deal with trauma today. I also told you there's a tipping point in everything. And there's a starting point in everything as well. We have all dealt, if you will, with some type of trauma in our lifetime. Some of us more than others. I mean, some of us have. The word trauma is defined as an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, like rape, like an event of a natural disaster. Trauma comes immediately after an event. Being in shock and denial, that's typical. Longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions. Flashbacks, I call that PTSD, that's what Joseph will go through. Strained relationships and even physical symptoms like headaches and, and nausea. I mean, that's what trauma brings to your body. The tipping point of any trauma begins before the actual event of trauma happens. Do you realize that? Joseph's pit experience started way before he was tossed into the pit. It started way back when he was favored, which birthed jealousy in his brothers. And that's a trauma that they're dealing with, by the way. So it's serious business. And then there's drama which is defined as a, a play for theater, a play for radio, a play for television. It's a spectacle. It's a dramatization. Someone is acting, you know what I'm saying? Either acting up or acting out. <laughs> Someone is laying it on thick to make their point. And we're going to see Joseph make his point. If you have ever lost a loved one, it traumatizes you for a season. And inside your head, you start dramatizing in your thoughts. I mean, you start playing back everything that happened over and over again on a loop in your head. You, you start asking yourself the question like, what could I have done to prevent this death? What could I have done to prevent this accident? I mean, what could I have done to prevent this tragedy? You start asking yourself that over and over again. How could I have prevented this from ever happening? I mean, what did I miss? You feel absolutely hopeless. That's how we all feel. And then we come to the story of Joseph the dreamer, which is full of trauma and drama. Trauma is a starting point of this story. Joseph is the apple, if you will, of his mother's eye. Rachel loves her son because she was barren for so long. Her firstborn son, as he becomes her husband's, watch this, Jacob's favorite son. Be careful with that. So he gives his favorite son this 
special coat of many colors. It's about to happen. How many of you know that favoritism can birth trauma within the unfavored? Favoritism can birth trauma within those who are unfavored, who feel ostracized, who feel not wanted, who feel not loved. Joseph had 10 brothers, and they were all his older brothers from his father's unloved wife, Leah. Whew, that don't sound good. And so her sons felt that pain of being unloved, of being pushed back, of being not wanted, just as her mother did. That's not a good thing. When you look at the big picture, they feel that Joseph has stolen their father. That's what they feel. I mean, why wouldn't you feel that way? After all, we're the older brothers. I mean, come on. Joseph is this dream over here. <laughs> so how is he so important and we're not? Joseph dreams a dream, and he tells his brother and his father that you guys are going to bow and serve me as your ruler. Some of us tell us sometimes it's just best to keep your mouth closed and keep some things to yourself. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But Joseph is sharing his dreams. I mean, they're his dreams after all. So we see Jacob asking his son, his favorite son now, Joseph, to go out in the field and to spy on his 10 brothers. Go see what they're doing and come back and, and tell me. <laughs> How many of you know that snitches get stitches? And, and sometimes, especially in this case, they get ditches. But you have to ask yourself the question, why would Jacob send his favorite son into the enemy's camp? I mean, it doesn't make Jacob the smartest light bulb in the box, does it? Why would you send Joseph into their territory? Why would you send him into the field? You, you know Joseph's not a field hand. You know Joseph is always with you, protected. Why would you send him into the unknown, into elements where he's at his weakest? I don't know what Jacob was thinking, but he did it. I told you, every action provokes a reaction. Now, imagine yourself being Joseph at the age of 17. And your father's told you to go out in the field and check on your brothers, spy on your brothers, and come back and give me a report. Imagine that you're walking up on your brothers, all ten of them, and you hear them plotting to kill you. I mean, how does that make you feel? Well, Joseph, like you, these are my big brothers, and they're just joking. They're just pulling my leg. They do this stuff all the time. Well, well, hold up. It might have seemed like a joke until they grabbed him and threw him into the pit. Now, things become real. And Joseph realized th this is... These boys are not playing. Houston, Joseph has a problem. <laughs> now, I've been through some trouble in my days and time, but I, I've never had my brothers plot to kill me. I mean, I've never, well, hold on. Terry, <laughs> Melvin, <laughs> Jerry, oh, hold up. Have y'all been, I'm just, I'm just joking. I know Charles wouldn't, but Charles is like Benjamin. He's that baby brother. Charles is going to protect me. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But think about it. We don't know if Joseph is claustrophobic. But we do know that trauma sets in real fast. Yeah, there's no opportunity for fight and flight. I mean, he's in the pit. I mean, they've agreed to put him in it, so he's in the pit. And that pit represents, watch this, the grave. It represents burial. As far as the brothers are concerned, Joseph is dead to them. And for the betterment, because now they have time to spend with their father. But imagine being taken out of that pit and now being sold into slavery. Because that's the next step in this process. They decide to take him out of the pit and sell him into slavery. Now, as a teenager, your brain isn't fully developed until you're 25 years old. And so you don't have the coping skills. I mean, you're weak at this particular point in your, in your thinking. You're not at the top of your game. And so Joseph has to be terrified. You're talking about trauma? Oh, my gosh. The favorite son is being traumatized. And the father has no clue. But we're told that God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. I can't say enough. God was with Joseph. Now, you look at this and you say, wow, how could his brothers want to kill him? But when we look at the story in the Bible, Joseph wasn't the only brother who was trying to be killed by his family members. I mean, we know the story about Cain killing Abel. We know that Esau wanted to kill Jacob, Joseph's father. And we know that Lucifer wanted to, to dethrone God. He wanted to kill God in heaven. I mean, sometimes when you look at it, your enemies are closer to you than a brother. And sometimes your enemies are your own family members. I mean, sometimes. Now, 
Imagine being Joseph's brother. Let's see this from every point of view. Who were sick and tired of being sick and tired of their father, you know, just raving about his favorite son, Joseph. I mean, that would get on anybody's last nerve. And raving about, you know, how Rachel, Joseph's mother, is his favorite as well. You got to look at these brothers and realize that their mother was traumatized. Leah was traumatized by this favoritism. And you got to look at the brothers and you realize that they are traumatized over this favorite son situation here. So imagine what they're going through. Not that they should be trying to kill their brother, but imagine what they're going through. I just want to show you how we have trauma in our homes. I mean, how we bring this trauma on ourselves. We do it to ourselves. So imagine being Jacob and being lied to by his sons, that his favorite son, Joseph, is dead. That some beast has killed him, and here he is, has this coat that's all bloody as they return it back to their father, Jacob. And so now Jacob becomes traumatized. He's got PTSD, for sure. And so the brothers, they had a plan thinking that they would get more time with the father, but but now that, that's a loss. Because now Jacob, let's be for real, Jacob is in, he's in grieving. I mean, he's in mourning for a lifetime. I mean, he's broken. I mean, who wants a broken man around? I mean, that's what they got. They got a broken man. And all he's doing is holding on to his his son, his next favorite son is Benjamin. So this was a waste when you look at the big picture. I mean, they had lost their brother now, <laughs> Joseph, and now they've lost their father. Wow. So while all this is going on, I mean, Joseph walking upon his brothers, talking about killing them, <laughs> thrown into a pit, then he's pulled out and tossed into slavery. And then he comes into the captain of the guard, Pharaoh's captain of the guard, his house. And then he's thrown into prison because of a lie that his wife told. But Joseph never gave up on his dreams. He said, Donnie, how is that possible? Well, let me prove it to you. When the captain of the guard purchases Joseph, he realized that Joseph has a blessing, has a calling on his life. And so he appoints Joseph over everything that he has, over his house, over his land. I mean, he makes Joseph the overseer because he says Joseph has favor and he's a good man. You see, God was with him, even in that situation. Joseph is holding on. So we see Joseph finally being blessed, finally having favor. I mean, he's overseer of the captain of the guard's house and his land. And then here comes this but moment. But the captain's wife, yeah, she pursues Joseph. She pursues him to have sex with him. And no matter how many times she tries, he repeatedly refuses her advances. Joseph refused to dishonor God. But he also refused to dishonor the captain of the guard who had blessed him. So he refused to sleep with his wife. Joseph is tossed into prison at the age of 28, all based on a lie that the captain's wife told that he tried to sexually assault her. Now, when you look at the law, this is an offense that's punishable by death. Trauma, more trauma. The captain of the guard did not have Joseph put to death because he knew the blessing on Joseph's life. He knew that Joseph wasn't going to forfeit all that blessing to mess with his nasty wife. Yeah, I'm sure this wasn't her first time, her first encounter trying to commit adultery on her husband. So Joseph was placed into prison with Pharaoh's prisoners. You know, it's two prisons. One is where everybody else goes, and then one goes where the king sends you. But God was with Joseph. And he gave him favor with the keeper of the prison. Joseph starts running the prison, and the prison prospered. Everything Joseph touches prospered. I'm quite sure that pit prospered. You see, I told you that Joseph didn't give up, that he held on to his dreams. And while he was in prison, Joseph interpreted the butcher and the baker's dreams. God will make you fruitful in your land of affliction. God will make you fruitful in your land of affliction. Now imagine being summoned by Pharaoh to the palace. <laughs> you're thinking you're about to be beheaded because of what happened with the lie with the captain of the guard's wife, but you're not. Now imagine also being appointed by Pharaoh as second in command as governor over all of Egypt. It amazes me how Joseph never talks about his trauma. Do you realize that? The day that you and I gave our life to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that confession should be the confession that you talk about more than anything 
I mean, anything else. Joseph never talked about his trauma. He never brought it up. We bring up our past like we're not even saved. We continue to bring up stuff, mud, dirt, you name it. We continue to talk about it no matter how bad it was. We continue to just roll it back out every time. The belief, the confession that you made when you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that should be your main topic. Yeah, see, see, everything else is drama. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but that's, that's all drama that you want to get involved in. You want to bring back, drag back all that stuff. No, release your trauma and stop living in your drama. Joseph loved doing things for people. Joseph was like a shadow of Jesus Christ. He loved serving. Joseph's gifts never had a respect of person or place or position because the Lord was with him. Now, there's trauma in that pit, but there's also trauma in your marriage. Your marriage is in a pit right now, but your marriage is blessed. You know why? Because you're in that marriage. You see, God is with you in that marriage. So, so you're blessing that marriage by being in it. Like Joseph was a blessing to that pit by being in that pit. Trauma was in slavery. Joseph is in a house where the captain's wife is trying to, to rape him, basically. But the captain's house is blessed because Joseph is in the house. I pray you get this, because God is with him. There was trauma being thrown into prison. But Joseph is blessing the prison. The prison prospers <laughs> because Joseph is in the prison. Do you get me? Wherever you are, that place is blessed because you have shown up in that place. The prison was blessed and it prospered as well. I pray that if you have a son or a daughter who's in prison right now, I pray that you pray a prayer over them, that you bless them, that you pray that God will be with them, that he will give them favor, and that he will show them grace like he did with Joseph. Joseph didn't allow his trauma to overcome him. Instead, he overcame it. Joseph is the original, if you will, OG. He's the original overcomer because God was with Joseph. Joseph's brothers tossed him. They tossed their blessing, if you will, into a pit. How many of you have thrown your siblings into a pit? I know you're saying, well, Donnie, I've never just thrown my sister or brothers into a pit. Well, well, hold up, not physically, but verbally. You're doing it to yourself. You're, you're killing the blessed one in the family. Yeah, there's always one or two or three. There's always individuals in the family who's blessed, who, who God is with. It's because they're giving their time to him. And so he's giving his time back to them. I told you, every action provokes a reaction. Trauma is real, and so is drama. And everything has a tipping point. But everything also has a starting point. What's left to do? <laughs> it's very simple. It's time. Yeah. You've lived this life through all of its ups and downs, through all of its trauma and drama. And you have no peace. I pray that you have enough sense to give your life to Jesus Christ today. I pray that you're tired of living in that world. Yes. Don't get me wrong. Nothing's perfect. But all that trauma that you keep bringing up, you don't have to. Jesus will take that on. Yeah, cast all your cares on him. I just pray that you realize that trauma creates drama. Don't forget Romans 10 and 9. Confess with your mouth. Here we go. Come on, come on. That Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And guess what? You too shall be saved. Don't forget, God is God.